After a little break, we're glad to be back. And it's great to return with Professor Jean Abraham, who will be discussing the progress which she and her team are making in personalised breast cancer medicine. Jean is a professor at the University of Cambridge and an academic honorary consultant in medical oncology, hopefully I'm getting all these words right, Jean, at Cambridge University Hospitals, where she co-leads uh, the pioneering personalised breast cancer programme. In today's talk, Jean will be discussing her work, the impact which the programme is having, and perhaps more importantly, what it means for patients. There's a lot going on in this field and especially here in Cambridge, so we're very lucky to have Jean here with us today. As usual throughout today's talk, if you're watching through Zoom, you can ask questions at any time uh, using the Q&A box, which we'll try to address at the end of the talk. We will do our best to include any comments made by those watching on YouTube, uh, but please don't be too disappointed if yours is not included, as we often have a very chatty audience. And finally, to reassure you all, you won't be seen or heard throughout this event, but it will be recorded to be made available on our website and the CBC YouTube channel afterwards, and a link will be forwarded to you by email. So without any further delay, let me hand it over to Jean. Thank you again. Um, so uh, as Tony's explained, uh, my, um, I'm a Professor of Precision Breast Cancer Medicine at the University of Cambridge, and what I'm going to do today is uh, go through some of the work that um, uh, I'm doing and several other members of the uh, Cancer Research UK breast programme and actually some of the integrated cancer medicine team, uh, team are doing as well. So I'm going to start very simple, though, and just uh, really talk you through uh, the phrase pre uh, precision breast cancer medicine. We hear it a lot, and I, I thought it was worth just explaining um, what it is really referring to. So usually it is referring to um, adapting treatment recommendations for an individual based on either their inherited characteristics as a person um, or their molecular characteristics of the cancer. It could depend on the time point of the treatment and the particular risks and benefits for that particular patient. It should also uh, encompass things like patient preference and what we call comorbidities, which are the other medical conditions that people often have when they are diagnosed with breast cancer and also uh, lifestyle issues. Another area where we can personalize um, uh, our medicine is really the screening and prevention uh, area. And here again, we may use inherited characteristics uh, for the patient or the person and family history is another feature that we'd look at and imaging characteristics such as breast density. So again, going back to um, the very start of uh, what breast cancer is, you can see in the top uh, left hand corner, um, the, the normal breast tissue with the lymph nodes, uh, the ducts that go towards the areola and the nipple and the lobes where um, the milk is produced. And you can see that in stage one, you might have a very small cancer that's just uh, um, confined to the breast. And then as the stages progress, you can see that the cancer may get bigger. It may include the lymph nodes. And at stage three, which is also sometimes um, when split into different components called locally advanced um, disease, this is a much larger tumour with many more lymph nodes involved. There is a particular kind of uh, stage three breast cancer, which actually does not have any uh, mass or lump that you can feel sometimes, but actually you just feel, you can just see that your breast is very red or hot. Um, and that's because there are cancer cells blocking the uh, lymphatic vessels and causing swelling and redness. And that's called inflammatory breast cancer. So if you see any changes like that, then obviously please do go and see your GP. Um, the, the, the final stage that um, we talk about is stage four, and this is the most advanced form of breast cancer and usually not a curative. Um, and this is where the breast cancer has spread from where it began in the breast or the lymph nodes and uh, gone to the liver, lungs, lymph nodes, bone or occasionally brain. So if we just look at some statistics, breast cancer, there's about 55,000 new breast cancer cases every year. So that's about 150 a day. Uh, it's the commonest um, uh, cancer and about 15% of all new cases. And that statistic came from 2017. Men do get breast cancer too. There's about 390 new cases um, uh, in, in 2019, uh, 2017, that's about average. 
And in terms of deaths from breast cancer, it's about 11,500. Uh, and it's about 7% uh, of all um, de total deaths. But what you can see, which is heartening, is that the trend over time is that we're getting better at treating breast cancer. And that might be because of screening or better treatments or better surgery. The other striking um, statistics are really that um, finding your breast cancer late is, is, is not a good thing. And really, we need to focus on finding breast cancer in the early stages where it can most definitely be cured. So early detection and optimal treatment of high risk breast cancer is, is really very critical. So with that in mind, breast cancer screening in the NHS is available to all women from the ages of 50 to 70 every three years. Breast cancer screening saves about 1,300 lives a year in the UK. And we know, though, that there is a, a, also a risk of overtreatment and overdiagnosis. And what that means is that the chance of screen detecting by uh, mammography, a cancer that would not have caused death nor any clinical problems during the woman's lifetime. But nonetheless, screening saves lives. And so it's important to think about um, and uh, if, if you're happy to uh, uh, take up screening. What we are doing is um, looking at ways to adapt our screening uh, trials so they are targeted more to the individual. And so Fiona Gilbert is the UK uh, principal investigator for a study called MyPEBS, which is a European study aiming to recruit eight, 85,000 patients between the ages of 40 and 70 for a personalised screening strategy, which means that they will be um, given their screening based on family history, uh, certain DNA changes that are found uh, by analysing their saliva and looking at um, their initial uh, mammogram. More nationally and locally, um, Professor Gilbert is also uh, leading a study called BRAID, which uh, is looking at randomising patients either into um, being given standard of care treatment, so what you'd normally get, or being given uh, one of um, three different types of imaging. And here we're really trying to look at women who have what's called um, increased breast density uh, and that's a problem because that puts them at higher risk of breast cancer but also it's harder to see properly on mammograms. So when a, a person is diagnosed with breast cancer um, normally either they're screen detected uh, during screening as we've just talked about or they go to their GP um, because they found a breast lump. The GP then will refer to um, a clinic like ours at Addenbrooke's and then they will have a, a history taken. Um, so you'll tell us your story. We'll do a mammogram, an ultrasound and perhaps take a biopsy. And the biopsy will then be reviewed by a pathologist and they will look for uh, common uh, breast cancer markers such as estrogen receptors, progesterone receptors, which may be familiar to you because they're the, what they call the female hormones and also a protein called HER2 which we'll talk about a little bit more down the line. All of these results are then discussed in our multidisciplinary team meeting where we have oncologists, so cancer specialists, imaging specialists called radiologists, pathologists who look at the tumour under a microscope and surgeons. We also have input from our genetics department and in Cambridge we have a specialist molecular tumour board which I'll talk about later. All of these are then used to agree a plan which is then fed back to the treating clinician and also to the patient. What this helps us to do is really understand how we should treat the breast cancer. So uh, by looking at the staging, we can understand whether it's uh, curable and how aggressively to treat it. And by looking at the different markers, we can tell what subtype of breast cancer uh, a, a person has. And we'll talk a little bit more about subtypes down the line. What kind of tests you get in different hospitals might vary. Um, many um, hospitals now will routinely uh, do BRCA1, BRCA2 and PALB2 testing if family history, age or testing criteria fit or if they're in a clinical trial. We have also more recently started to do things uh, to do with the immune system, such as look at immune cells, such as tumour infiltrating lymphocytes and also immune biomarkers such as pdl one we may also do some additional testing on a case by case basis, which may be panel testing, or again, if you're going into a clinical trial or are reviewed by our genetics team, you may get extra local panel testing. And we'll, we'll talk about the difference between panel testing and whole genome testing shortly. 
Once we have all this information, we plug a lot of it into something called the predict algorithm or predict tool. And you can look at this yourself on www.predict.nhs.uk. This was developed by an investigator in Cambridge called Professor Paul Farrow. And here we put into it um, many of the characteristics that are um, of interest um, uh, in terms of trying to decide what treatment options you should have. And then this will tell us how much benefit you will get uh, or not get from all of those different treatment options. And we often sit in clinic and we'll go through this with you. When we think about the type of treatment options, um, what we will have are um, local therapies and also um, systemic therapies. And local therapies refer to things like surgery and radiotherapy and uh, systemic therapies um, refer to things like uh, chemotherapy, hormonal therapy and targeted therapy. So surgery and radiotherapy um, are primarily geared to prevent disease at, at the site where the cancer actually started. Although radiotherapy does have um, benefits beyond local benefits and has what we call survival benefits also. Chemotherapy and hormone therapy and targeted therapy, and I'll explain the difference shortly, um, also um, benefit the local disease but also go into your uh, entire blood and lymphatic system and try and prevent disease recurring in a more distant um, part of the body and of course in the early disease setting what we're aiming to do is cure you. One of the things that we've realised over the last 15 years is that one size of breast cancer simply doesn't fit everybody in terms of treatment and that breast cancer really isn't just one disease um, and we need to really uh, personalise and optimise our treatment with high intensity treatments for patients who are likely to um, relapse and avoid unnecessary treatments and toxicity in those that will not be at high risk of relapse. So this is probably one of the most complex slides that I have and I'm going to walk you through this step by step. This is called a Kaplan-Meier curve and we use it commonly in medicine when we're describing the impact of um, how someone will do over time with different types of characteristics. So what you can see here is that each line is a different subtype of breast cancer, and there's 10 of them, and they are called INT clusters or IC, and they're labelled 1 through to 10. At the beginning, when the study starts at time zero, you can see that 100% of the patients are alive. And over time, which is on the, on the x-axis in years, you can see that different numbers of patients will relapse or die. And that depends on the subtype of breast cancer that they have. And we're going to talk about some of those subtypes in a second. So if we look at this pink line, you can see that the patients who have this subtype of breast cancer actually over a 12 year period do pretty well. Almost 90% of them have not relapsed or died. And uh, this is an estrogen receptor uh, positive breast cancer that has a good outlook. Conversely, this is also an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer on the green line. And here you can see, however, that actually uh, many more patients do not do so well over an eight year period and actually 60% um, of patients have relapsed or um, died in that in that period. And so what you can see is that these two patients both have estrogen receptor positive breast cancer and will look identical to the clinician in, in, um, in the clinic, but biologically they're quite different. Similarly, we have tumours that have uh, a high immune um, uh, 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 level of immune cells and also what we call triple negative uh, breast cancer, which are negative uh, for estrogen, progesterone and HER2, and we'll talk about that in a, a, in a bit more detail shortly. And finally, we're going to talk um, right now actually about the HER2 cohort. So these are patients who have a protein called HER2, which we're going to talk about because we're going to talk about targeted therapies. So a targeted therapy is a treatment that is um, directed specifically to a particular point in a pathway uh, or in a or particular points in a pathway, um, a biological pathway for a particular subtype of cancer. So in about the mid 1980s, um, it was discovered that um, patients or uh, cells that had a high level of the protein HER2 had an increased rate of growth in terms of um, breast cancer cell tumor rate growth. 
And the hypothesis was that if we could stop the HER2 protein working by blocking it, we could probably stop the rate of growth of those cancer cells. So a monoclonal antibody, so a monoclonal antibody is something, is a drug that acts only on one substance or binds only to one substance, was developed. And in clinical trials, it was seen in the late 1990s that in fact, if you were treated with Herceptin, and here we've got another Kaplan-Meier curve. So again, at the beginning of the study, there are all the patients are alive at time zero. And then over a period of five years, you can see that the patients who are treated with Herceptin have a 20% better survival rate than um, disease-free survival rate than those that do not get treated with Herceptin. And so now Herceptin and other drugs like Herceptin are part of our standard of care. But you can see that that from discovery to actually coming into the clinic took an awfully long time. So I'm going to talk to you now about um, some of the research that's being done in the Cancer Research UK Cambridge Centre and primarily within the breast cancer programme. And I am here talking really about many people's work um, and uh, I will mention them along the way. Some of the key questions that my patients will often ask is, what's my risk of relapse and or death? Or will I be cured? What's my best treatment or management option? What are the likely side effects um, that I'll have either in the short term or long term? How early can I know if a treatment is not working or in fact, if it is working, do I really need all this treatment? Do I need additional treatment or surveillance once I've finished the, the initial treatment? Are any of my family at risk of cancer? So we're trying to answer these questions with the studies and um, uh, research that we are doing. And I've split these up into, into little sections. And the first section is really about uh, personalized therapy and bringing genomics into clinical trials and in, uh, together to really personalize treatment. So we're gonna talk about whole genome sequencing. So whole genome sequencing is the process with DNA of uh, really reading the order of the component parts of a DNA molecule. And I want to really draw a comparison to what it's like when you read a book. So if you read a book, you open it and you only look at the chapter headings, you're gonna get a rough idea of what the book is about. That's a little bit like what we used to do with panel testing. We'd pick out the genes that we thought were most relevant and we put them on a panel and we'd look at those and make some conclusions from that. But what we're doing now it, with whole genome sequencing is we're opening up that book and we are starting to read the genome. Now read is an important phrase in sequencing because it refers to the number of times that a, 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 a whole genome is actually gone through or read or looked at. And depth. So if you read a book quickly, you've got five minutes um, just while you're walking to the bus stop or something like that, and you um, quickly look through a book, you'll get a little bit of information. If you have a cup of coffee, you sit down, you really put your feet up and have a good read through, you'll understand and remember a lot more. So depth is about how much detail are we looking at the genome in. And depth, uh, sorry, depth and read are two features of sequencing. If you have cancer, you have two genomes. You have your tumor genome, which is called your somatic genome, and, and you have your germline genome, which is what you've inherited from your patients. If you like your baseline, what you came into the world with. And in these genomes, what we look at is um, variations with, uh, in the DNA and also something called the RNA, which is the sort of messenger that helps us convert DNA to protein. And we'll look at whether there is too much or too little um, of these uh, variations, and we call those gains and losses. This generates a huge amount of data, and one of the critical things that we have to learn to do is actually decipher what we call the signal from the noise. So what's actually valuable to us in terms of treating the patient, and what's just background noise. And we've been doing this for several years now in a programme called the Personalised Breast Cancer Programme, and in this project we do whole genome sequencing of both the DNA and, and the RNA, for patients with any stage of breast cancer, whether it's early stage or late stage, patients are asked if they'd like to consent. We take a tumour and a blood sample. We send it to our uh, industry partner, Illumina, who does our sequencing for us. The sequencing is then sent back to us and we'll discuss the results of that in our oncogenomics review board. And if we think there's something important that might change a patient's 
treatment, we will what we call validate it, which is a double check, and then we will make a decision with the clinician and the patient as to what we can do. And the types of things we see are changes in um, the amount of tumour uh, mutation that we see, so the amount of DNA variation that we see. We can see if people are um, at risk of drug toxicity, if they have a hereditary risk for certain cancers. And these all will help us to personalize the treatment based on those findings. So that's the um, personalized breast cancer program, which is a sequencing project. And what we ask our patients to do that come to Cambridge, they're incredibly patient with us. Uh, they co-consent into another study if they have triple negative breast cancer called PARTNER. And I'm gonna tell you why that co-consent is important in a, in a minute, but let me tell you a little bit about PARTNER first. So PARTNER is what we call a neoadjuvant breast cancer study, which means that essentially we are giving chemotherapy before surgery or some other kind of targeted therapy before surgery. And this is for triple negative breast cancer patients, and I'll, I'll explain that in a second. And what we're doing is we're comparing standard chemotherapy versus standard chemotherapy plus a new agent called Alaparib. So triple negative breast cancer is breast cancer that doesn't um, express estrogen, progesterone, or HER2 protein. It's about 15 to 20% of all breast cancers. And there is some biological overlap with what we call BRCA positive hereditary breast cancers. Um, so something about the way they behave may be similar to, to those type of hereditary breast cancers. How do we usually treat it with chemotherapy alone? Because you can't use things like trastuzumab, which was the Herceptin, the HER2 drug that we talked about earlier. Um, and apart from surgery and radiotherapy, it's really only chemotherapy which is available. So we set up a study called PARTNER in which patients with hereditary breast cancer and triple negative breast cancer uh, who are in the early stage disease setting are offered either chemotherapy or chemotherapy plus a novel targeted agent called Olaparib. They, they have 21 weeks of treatment in total and then they have surgery and the study was in three stages. There was a safety stage and then a stage that looked about at the timing at which Olaparib was given. Should it be given before chemo starts or should it be given after chemo starts? And we're now in the third phase of it where we're actually looking at the effectiveness of the different arms of this trial. And what we're really looking at is when a patient has gone through 21 uh, weeks of treatment, how much cancer is actually left in the surgical specimen that's removed at surgery? because that helps us to understand what their risk of relapse is, because in triple negative breast cancer and also in HER2 breast cancer, uh, in, uh, what we see is if there is a lot of tumour left, the risk of relapse is much higher. So why is it important to us that patients co-consent into these studies? Uh, and I think it really comes down to how much we can start to personalise our patients' care. So here we have three actual patients, obviously we haven't named them, who have almost identical ages, almost identical stages of breast cancer, and they're all triple negative breast cancers. And they have all consented to the personalized breast cancer uh, program, the sequencing project and to partner. And you'll see how different they really are. So the first patient, when she had her, her um, sequencing done, was found to have um, changes which imply that she has an increased hereditary risk of colorectal cancer and endometrial cancer and has a syndrome called Lynch syndrome. And actually, in fact, many of her family members also needed to be screened. We also knew because she had a high rate of uh, changes in her uh, tumor, so a high tumor mutation burden, um, that actually if she relapsed, that immunotherapy was probably the first place to go in terms of um, treatment. In fact, she had an excellent outcome uh, after treatment. She had no um, disease left at all at surgery and has done very well. The second lady was found to have a genetic changes, which actually meant that she had some of those high risk genes that we talked about earlier, the BRCA genes. And in fact, um, if she relapsed, and again, she was someone who would need to have uh, a conversation with her family, referral to genetics and potentially family screening, 
And if she relapsed, the best agent for her to have would be a DNA damage repair agent such as a laparib, which in fact she didn't get in the trial because she got uh, the control chemo only arm. She didn't do so well and had quite a lot of um, uh, tumour left at surgery. The final patient uh, has no hereditary features found in the sequencing data, but was found in the germline or inherited data to have a high risk of severe toxicity with certain types of chemotherapy. So we knew that if anything happened in terms of relapse with this patient, that we must avoid certain types of chemotherapy with her. So unfortunately, she had a very good response. So you can see that although they look identical from a clinical perspective at first glance, when you start to look at the genetic information behind that, um, that actually they're very different in terms of how we need to manage and treat them and their families as well. So this is a comment that was made to me by a patient who was sent as a second opinion referral to me. Um, and she had had treatment somewhere else and was a patient who had basically had quite a lot of tumour left at surgery and she was a um, very bright woman who really understood the implications of that in terms of her risk of relapse. She said, I know I have a really bad outlook. I think, uh, I feel like there's very little I can do about this. There just doesn't seem to be any treatments available after you've finished chemotherapy, surgery and radiotherapy. And every new drug seems to take forever to be available for people like me. And I'm worried it will come too late for me. She was really someone who inspired myself and my team to add an additional component to the partner um, trial, uh, which is called partnering. And essentially, if you are a triple negative breast cancer patient and you come into the partner trial and you've got to six cycles of treatment and we don't think you're responding how we would like, um, what we will then do is actually check that you do have disease left by taking a biopsy and then we will give you an additional eight weeks of immunotherapy and a new novel drug uh, which is another targeted agent on a different pathway um, and what we are really looking at is whether this early introduction of these drugs makes a difference a to how much uh, cancer is left when we do the surgery and b do any of the biomarkers or tests that we do indicate that even if the surgical outcome hasn't changed, that actually the patient is responding and that we are going to be able to prevent the risk of relapse. So what you say to us in clinic and to, uh, tell us about really matters because it inspires us to think about what we're doing and how we're changing our trials to, to answer the questions that you want us to answer. So I've talked a lot about the early stages of um, breast cancer and how we treat that uh, using triple negative breast cancer as an example. I'm gonna mention briefly now a study that's actually run by a colleague of mine, Richard Baird. Um, and this is in the late stage or metastatic disease setting. And this trial is called the Basket of Baskets and it's run by a European consortium called Cancer Core Europe. And it's not just for breast cancer patients, but it's actually for multiple tumor types. And the premise is that you are going to treat patients based on the molecular or biological change that you find when you do a particular set of tests using something called the eye profiler, which this uh, Cancer Core Europe team have developed. And based on these changes, you will be allocated into different baskets. So if you have mutation A, um, you might go into a basket A treatment, which means that you'll have a particular type of targeted agent for that pathway. Likewise for B, likewise for D, and likewise for C. And these are uh, agents that are from uh, will be from multiple uh, drug companies and for multiple different types of mutations. So this is really um, leveraging our understanding of um, matching the molecular change with the type of treatment, but in the late stage disease setting. So we've talked a lot about personalizing treatment based on genomics, but one of the things we also need to do is actually reduce treatment where it's not needed, but we need to reduce treatment safely and reduce uh, so that we're reducing side effects and resource and costs, but not reducing the effectiveness for the patient concerned. We've got two excellent examples in uh, the breast cancer programme of work that's been done that's already um, shown that we can do this. So this is work from uh, Professor Elna, Helena Earl, who um, 
essentially showed that uh, trastuzumab or Herceptin, the drug that we talked about that targets HER2, um, when it was originally developed, it was given to everybody for 12 months. But she did a trial which actually looked to see if in, um, in certain types of HER2 patients, six months was just as good as 12 months. And what we saw that was that 12 months of uh, trastuzumab um, uh, increased uh, survival rates, but actually in women um, in women with uh, with the HER2 biomarker, but actually in some women, six months did um, pretty much the same job. Um, and so what we could do now is actually in uh, specific cases for the benefit of patients, reduce the amount of treatment that they're having. And that means that we can reduce the risk of uh, cardiac side effects, which is a, uh, which is a risk, uh, a small but very important risk um, that's relevant to patients who are treated with this drug. From an economic perspective, um, the, the trial savings, so the, the savings cost by not uh, savings, the cost savings that we accumulated by not treating because we had the evidence not to treat was nearly £10,000 per patient. And in low and middle income uh, countries, this evidence has been hugely beneficial in allowing them to reduce treatment safely um, whilst making sure that the, the population was well treated. On a similar vein, uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Charlotte Coles, um, has similarly looked at whether partial radiotherapy, um, so um, radiation beams focused in uh, on the breast that uh, try to prevent local re recurrence of disease, um, whether partially doing uh, uh, irradiating the breast was as good as whole breast irradiation. And this was done in two trials called Import Low and Import High. And you can see that um, there were many, many centers in the UK that were involved. And here again, what we found was that uh, actually we could reduce uh, the amount of um, radiotherapy given. And a, and a further study called the Fast Forward study, in fact, also found that we could shorten the period of time over which some, of, uh, some patients could receive radiotherapy. And many of these changes have now been brought into standard practice. And there's been a, a cost saving um, because of this of about 16 million pounds per year for the NHS. So in terms of impact that, uh, that the research that our program does has, it's pretty um, impactful. So in the last section, I'm gonna talk about data integration. So this is something that you hear a lot about AI, machine learning uh, and data integration. And, and an awful lot of the work that we do uh, uh, stems around understanding what data matters and when the particular bits of data matter and why it matters. We've been doing this for a long time and Professor Paul Farrow, who I mentioned earlier with the PREDICT algorithm, um, actually uses a very simple al algorithm which uses um, characteristics of the patient and their receptor status to um, help us understand what their outlook is in terms of being treated with particular types of treatment and or not being treated with those treatments. And this uh, PREDICT tool has been used uh, 1.25 million times. There are 330,000 users in the UK and it's used by hundreds and thousands of um, people across all across the entire globe. Uh, and it's now approved by our UK NICE committee, which approves all our trials and device uh, and tools that we use. It has resulted in 7,500 NHS patients being offered chemotherapy who otherwise would not have received it, and 11,000 women being appropriately spared unnecessary uh, chemotherapy um, when they didn't need it. So that, so that has been up and running for quite a long time now. And what we're doing is really taking this to the next stage in some of the work that I'm doing with the Integrated Cancer Medicine theme and the breast programme and some commercial collaborators. And we are taking all the different component parts of the tests that patients have. So the clinical data, the imaging or radiological data, the gen genomics data, whether that's whole genome panel, 
or even if it's the circulating tumor DNA um, genomics that we haven't really touched on, but that we are still collecting. Um, and the pathology data, so what we're doing now is taking the slides that the pathologist looks at, and we are digitalizing those to create an image that we can then scan and start to break down and look at where different cell types are located. And um, taking information from each of these strands or modalities of data and bringing it together to see if we can understand how to um, really predict um, response earlier than we normally would in, uh, in, in treatment, in the treatment phase of patients. So we are doing this for patients like the patients in the partner trial. Um, and what we would like to do is use this to help us to make sure um, that we can achieve a number of different things. So what we, what we would like to see is that by um, having an early response predictor, so being able to say that this patient is either responding to this treatment or not responding, that we can give the appropriate um, treatment length in that we can reduce the amount of toxicity a patient has. And of course, if the patient is having this in the early setting, they are often going to be having um, surgery afterwards. So you want them in a good um, condition to be able to undergo surgery. So reduced recovery time before surgery. Um, and if a patient is not responding, then obviously you either need to get them to surgery early to remove the cancer, or you need to give them earlier access to novel or other um, standard of care therapies, which may give them a benefit and improve their outcome. And finally, what you want to do is to be able to um, reduce the risk of um, small fragments of tumour circulating throughout the body and embedding uh, more distantly and um, causing um, uh, what we call metastases or um, late stage disease recurrence elsewhere. But what's really important is that this information is generated in real time. And this type of work is going to be coming into um, the NHS because we have now the um, genomic laboratory hubs, which um, in some disease settings are now beginning to do whole genome sequencing. So triple negative breast cancer is now going to have whole genome sequencing done um, and uh, other cancers, certain paediatric cancers and some haematological cancers and high risk ovarian cancers are also having similar work done. For the other cancers, they will be looking at panel testing. And there is also um, a NHS national initiative looking at digital pathology. So taking pathology samples and putting them into the digital form in a project called PathLake. So much of the work that's being done here and elsewhere is, is, is being trickled into the NHS as well. Um, and that's really important that we can feed into the NHS the results that we're developing here. So we're pretty much coming towards the end of um, the session. And so uh, precision breast cancer medicine, can we achieve it? I think, I hope I've shown you that yes, we can achieve it, but there is still much more to do. And um, early detection and diagnosis is a big part of this. And in the new cancer research, Cambridge Cancer Research Hospital, we will have an entire um, a department that is focused on early detection and um, diagnosis, finding better ways to identify whether patients are responding to treatment and uh, therefore avoid toxicity, wasted time and resource, as we've talked about already during this um, uh, discussion are, are key. Being able to um, assess uh, what kind of features might suggest that you have a high risk of relapse or death and using novel biomarkers and finding effective treatments once you've found those novel biomarkers. Because what's, what's un unhelpful is to raise the expectation that we will find some novel markers, but then have nothing to do with them. So it's incredibly important that we work with the pharmaceutical industry to help find some um, impactful interventions that we can um, give to patients once we know that they're at risk. In order to achieve all of these things, our collaborations are going to have to span wider than just our normal MDT or multidisciplinary team meet, uh, meeting um, colleagues. So we are working very much with computer scientists, uh, engineers, chemists, 
um, computational biologists, um, pharm pharmaceutical and biotech industries uh, to find more innovative ways to achieve these aims. And what we really hope to do is co-locate this ambition and these projects into the new Cambridge Research uh, Cancer Research Hospital, where we hope to make innovation part of our standard of care for our patients um, in Cambridge, regionally and throughout the world. Because we hope that by developing some of these things, we can democratise the care by having algorithms that we can send out um, in the cloud or uh, in a remote fashion which means that wherever you are, you can access um, a really good level of care. I'm gonna finish with a, a request to all of you really. Um, and the request is that we are in the process at the moment of um, uh, really putting together the, the business cases for the Cambridge Cancer Research Hospital. And we want to make sure that it, it meets your needs. And I've just put up a little uh, screenshot of uh, join the cancer patient uh, network. Um, and there is a, a link there as well that um, I'm sure we can send out to anyone who's interested. And what we really want here is for you to tell us what's important to you. So if you have cancer, have had cancer, or if you've cared for someone who's had cancer or are just interested in cancer, then let us know your thoughts and what's important to you, because we would like um, to, to hear from as many of you as possible so that we can get a really comprehensive idea of, of what you need. And finally, it's just a thank you. A thank you to all of the programme members who work incredibly hard um, and, uh, and do some brilliant things. I haven't touched very much on the more laboratory based, um, some of the more laboratory based work. Um, and maybe we can do that another time, but that's, um, there is a huge amount of more basic research going on as well. In particular to our patient advisory groups without whom we could not design our studies and um, would not be able to really think through the patient component of it properly to our collaborators and especially to our funders. And back to you, Tony, I think. Thank you very much for listening. Lovely. Thank you ever so much, Stephen. That's been incredibly useful and, and um, explained it in such a, a brilliantly concise and clear way. So, yes, we've had a number of questions while you've been talking um, and some people have sent some stuff through um, ahead of the talk as well. So we'll try to go through as many as we can um, before we um, say goodbye at two o'clock. So let's see how we get on. Um, so the first one was uh, someone who said, I'm aged 74 and considered at high risk for breast cancer due to, a, due to dense breast tissue, family history and more. What can I do to lower my risk? So I think we talked about the um, aspect of dense breast tissue slightly during the um, uh, during the talk and and uh, I guess um, some of the things that you can do are um, self-examine because screening obviously occurs between a certain age range so 40 to 70 so 74 puts you outside of that um, but actually what we might find is some of the uh, targeted screening might mean that people who are, are in that age range but have breast stents may now come back into the screening um, um, arena, but that's to be found potentially. Uh, for this particular person, I would say that really there are just lifestyle things and self-examination. So um, self-examination itself has not been found to improve survival from breast cancer, but what it most certainly will do is teach you what's normal for your breasts. And therefore it will help you to understand what isn't normal and will get you to see someone sooner if something doesn't feel right. So um, it's important to know yourself and your and your own uh, physiology and your own anatomy. And, and then also things like weight loss, um, diet. I think a, a question just um, came up actually about um, more lifestyle issues. I think exercise, not smoking, reduced alcohol, um, all of uh, those kind of things, having a balanced diet um, are all incredibly important in, in the undefinable um, things that are much, much harder to actually pin down as being contributing to breast cancer. They undoubtedly do uh, exactly how we're still finding out. Um, but I think those are the kinds of things that, um, that you can do. Thank you. Um, someone just asked, what's the importance, uh, and sorry if I don't get the um, quite phraseology right, <laughs> um, what's the importance of CEA and CA15-3 when choosing the line of treatment and regarding the prognosis? So 
Um, those are um, blood test uh, biomarkers that uh, are often more often used in a, um, a later stage um, of breast cancer. And it could be that because we have quite a lot of genomics at hand uh, in Cambridge, I don't use those very much in the early disease setting, um, but they are used by by um, some of our consultants in the later stage setting, and they will help you um, identify whether you think a patient is um, responding to a treatment, or if you feel that it's in of itself alone, you would not necessarily change anything. But if combined with symptoms and or changes on a CT scan, you might start to say, well, actually, maybe we should switch treatments. But certainly in, in, in Cambridge, where we're doing sequencing, we are more dependent on those kind of more detailed information. The next one was, is there an age after which family history becomes less of a factor um, and age stroke personal situation is more relevant? So the pickup rate for um, her hereditary breast cancers does drop away after the age of 70. That said, in the partner trial, we do have patients in their late 60s and 70s who completely out of the blue for them have been found to have hereditary um, uh, types of um, cancer. So I think in, that, in the talk itself, I showed you two examples of patients with hereditary risk for different types of cancer. So I think... Um, Beyond 70, that uh, risk, um, uh, we, we pick up less patients with that high risk gene. Normally, patients with that high risk gene will present earlier. The whole point of the high risk gene is that, um, you know, they present earlier generally. Um, so so uh, and in that setting or if you're worried that you've got a family history that might indicate that, Again, just being self-aware, moderating lifestyle things are probably the most um, straightforward things to do. Um, yeah. Um, you, you touched on it um, briefly at the end, but what difference do you think the proposed cancer hospital um, could have on your work and, um, and how would it interact with the, the hospitals that are already on the, the Cambridge Biomedical Campus? So I think the Cancer Research Hospital will really be pivotal in um, just bringing together, uh, first of all, like-minded people who have an interest in, cam in cancer and breast cancer specifically, uh, to really crystallise the research that's going on and bring, because I, we, we have an incredibly unique environment in Cambridge. We have on one by a campus, um, you know, world leading um, biologists, uh, stem cell scientists, and also uh, really good clinical care, uh, people who are, uh, you know, absolute experts in immunology. So every aspect um, of, of what we need to, uh, you know, move um, breast cancer treatment forward. So, but what we also need to do is bring together people who work in different areas, like actually computational. So even gaming companies and uh, companies that make um, imaging machines are very, very good at computational work. And actually more and more our, uh, our data analysis requires that kind of expertise. Or chemists that look at pet protein fo folding um, in the development of new drugs. You know, this, all of these people have a space where they can come together and really innovate in that new hospital. Mm. Um, someone has asked in the chat, um, can this new technology be used for patients who've had breast cancer for five plus years? e.g. knowing their um, type of breast cancer, IC2, IC3, et cetera. Could this type of retrospective analysis also help researchers validate their understanding? Um, so if I've understood the question correctly, <laughs> so in order to actually um, sort of calculate the int cluster values, we need to be able to get a piece of tissue and some blood. So if you've had your cancer removed, um, then it's it, we won't have all the component parts we need to to calculate that. If we knew, um, so say we had, however, taken those um, those things at the beginning of your treatment, uh, and you're five years down the line, will that help us to understand when you might relapse? It may well do because the different int clusters that you saw on that graph obviously have um, different rates of relapsing over time. So we know that certain people 
actually probably don't need that much follow up because they're going to do well anyway. Whereas other people in the first three years may need really intense follow up because they're going to do not so well potentially in that time, particularly if they haven't responded to treatment. So they can, the subtyping can very much help with follow up as well as with current treatment. Mm, great. Um, so another one of the questions that had come through in advance, when do you think genetic, I knew I was going to get it, genetic sequencing for breast cancer patients will be available on the NHS at all hospitals? So uh, again, I think towards the end, I mentioned the genomic laboratory hubs, um, which uh, which have um, been set up in seven um, regions. And those laboratory hubs are now doing whole genome se sequencing for a variety of cancers. I think I mentioned um, pediatric rare diseases, uh, ovarian and triple negative breast cancer. Uh, for the other types, subtypes of breast cancer, they're not routinely doing whole genome sequencing. So the answer to for triple negatives is very soon. For the other breast cancers, um, I think because um, within the ER positive breast cancers, it's less easy to know whether the whole genome sequencing will actually give you information that's as valuable in terms of immediate care, um, that will probably take a bit more time until the costs of sequencing come down a little bit more. However, if you live in Cambridge or actually in one of the national centres that we're opening personalised breast cancer programme, you can get all of that for free anyway. Actually, that links into one of the next questions that's in the chat, um, which was someone who said that um, their mother had um, triple negative breast cancer and also a sister was um, and also diagnosed with breast cancer uh, in late 60s. At age 50, would I be able to enrol in the study to quantify my generic, uh, genetic risk? So I'm assuming that this person doesn't have any cancer at the moment that they are... No, they haven't said that in the chat. Before. Okay, yeah. so if we assume that they don't have cancer, um, they couldn't enrol into the projects that I spoke about because they are for breast cancer nice. patients. Um, there may be um, studies that are done from an epidemiological perspective, so looking at population health risk um, that will enrol patients looking at things like lifestyle um, risks. And there's a huge consortium called the um, BCAC consortium, which actually looks at this kind of uh, more uh, epidemiological population risk um, and lifestyle issue. There are those kind of studies that you can enroll into. But again, if you don't have breast cancer, it, it's hard to sequence something, okay. so, you know. Um, there are some very early studies coming out um, from uh, technologies using circulating tumour DNA looking at um, early detection. They're very early and they're not, and they're all still very much in the trial setting um, at the moment. Thank you. Um, and so that's an uh, interesting question. What's, what's your definition of cure? Um, how many <laughs> years of survival? I guess mean, this is a question that lots of people when they're diagnosed um, come out with. Um, or ask um, how many years of survival post treatment, and do you have any statistics on the relapse rate after um, someone has been cured? So um, that's a very good question, and the the phrase cure is um, is a tricky one, and. Um, Again, it depends on the subtype. So um, there will be ladies with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer who have a risk of relapse for, for a very long time because estrogen receptor positive breast cancer is very much hormone driven and, and can relapse. I mean, I have seen patients relapse after 15 years. So although they have no obvious disease after they've had their surgery and treatment, they st still have clearly either had a new cancer or have, have relapsed um, much later. And we see that with, with uh, estrogen receptor uh, positive breast cancer. With triple negative breast cancer, the vast majority of people, if they're going to relapse, will do it within the first five years. Although there are a few that come after that, obviously. Um, so it very much depends on the subtype. And I, I think cure is just one of those words we, what we're really saying is uh, from everything that we can tell there is no disease left and that we're not we are hopeful that the disease won't come back so uh, if i have a triple negative patient who has had 21 weeks of chemotherapy they go to surgery and they have no cancer left in their surgical specimen they have a very high chance of cure 
and to everything that we have to test, we think they probably don't have any cancer left and we hope that they won't, you know, that it won't come back. There are a few people in which it does, but, you know, so it's, it's a great question and very difficult to answer. Um, thank you. There's, a, there's lots of questions coming in now and we've only got five minutes to go, so I'm sorry that we won't be able to get around to all of them, but if I just quickly go through. Um, what are your thoughts on indeterminable mammogram and ultrasound result and choosing blood tests to identify high probability of positive cancer result? So, um, I think studies like MyPEBS and um, BRAID are actually great for that kind of question. So MyPEBS will look at um, your risk in other ways other than just the mammogram. So if you've had an indeterminate mammogram, that's a bit uh, difficult because, um, you know, you may be recalled sooner and um, it, it puts you in a slightly anxious place. Uh, so going into studies like MyPEBS, what you can do is actually have a further look at your risk in terms of the genetics and family history and see if the indeterminant should, you know, should be something that needs a very quick follow-up or could actually just be that you've got breast dense, you may need to have a different type of scanning. So, so I think um, we have studies here that uh, Professor Gilbert is running um, that could help distinguish that better. Okay. Um, someone has asked, um, Vera Ant was diagnosed with breast cancer when she was 36 and passed away before reaching 43. And there are multiple other cancers in my family history too. Um, I'm 42. What do you recommend um, that they should do? Um, so, <laughs> again, it's very difficult to answer that yeah. without sitting down and chatting to the person because uh, multiple different cancer types may be meaningful or not meaningful, depending on what type of brand. Uh, cancers they are. Um, I think when someone has a family member that's died at 36 from uh, breast cancer that always uh, um, for first um, uh, for relatives that are immediately related that does increase your own personal risk. Um, so uh, what you can do is I guess um, make sure that you minimize your own personal risks again all lifestyle based um, and, and then in terms of um, testing, you can speak to your GP or um, uh, ask your GP about being referred at the appropriate time uh, to talk to the genetics department about your family, about your family history. And of course, also being self-aware about any lumps or bumps that, you know, that you think may be coming up. Um, we're not routinely outside of clinical trials testing women like that but actually um, I may not be au fait with all the uh, clinical trials that the genetics department is running and my colleague um, uh, Professor Tiskovich in the genetics department may well have studies for people with strong family history that are being opened so it is worth um, keeping your ears to the ground and maybe um, getting in touch with the genetics department about that kind of thing. Um, looking over a couple of minutes, so one more question. Um, is it possible for breast cancer to spread and infect another organ or become malignant? Yes, so stage four breast cancer is breast cancer that has spread from um, where it started originally to other organs. Um, and the commonest organs are uh, liver, lungs, bone, um, lymph nodes, and occasional brain. Well, uh, that, unfortunately, time has got the best of us uh, today. So thank you all for joining us online. And obviously, a special thank you to you, Jean, for giving up your time. Um, as I said in the introduction, this talk will soon be available on the Cambridge Biomedical Campus YouTube channel. And for those who um, subscribe to Eventbrite, we'll be sending an email out to you with the link too. Um, and you can also catch up on there uh, with all the other virtual um, on-tour episodes. So um, it's... Just to say thank you again, Jean, and hope you all have thank a you. lovely rest of your day. And thanks again for watching. Thank you. Bye bye.